Well, uh, if you have your Bibles, that is where we're going to be in Romans 8 for our first week in uh, our month of Advent as we look at what it looks like to be a people that are rooted in hope. That is um, our first uh, week's theme is what does it look like to be a people of hope? And as we do that, we are longing in hope. As we talked about at the beginning of our gathering, um, this year's uh, theme for Advent for us adults is that we would be a people uh, that would be centered around uh, the cradle and not just the cross, yes, the cross, but also the crown. And so we don't want to forget any of that. We want to include all of that. Um, and so as we are a people of hope, um, I want you to just kind of put your mind's attention right here. There's no Jesus in here. So that's what we are entering into, a time of longing, a time of expectation, um, and a time of lack of fulfillment that is yet to come. That's why the end of that passage uh, is so great for us to really start that. Who hopes for what he sees? You don't hope for something you already have. No, you hope for something that is yet future. So that's what we're looking at as we look at the birth, but also we're longing for eternity. That's really where this uh, Advent season is different for us. We have consistently been a people that have re-entered into first century Israel, and I, I invite us to do that, to long for the coming of Messiah, that 400 years of silence and darkness and corruption, both politically and economically, that's the life that you're in if you're first century Israel. You're under Roman rule, and you hate it, and you hate them, and you're longing for something to give you some relief. We don't live in that kind of tension these days. Instead, we find relief. We find ways to get some temporary relief around us. That was a time of, of, that is not so different than ours, though. It was a time that was culturally busy. It was a time that was culturally loud, but it was spiritually quiet and dark. So it's in that reality that Advent becomes a bit of a paradox for us because our culture will speed up around us. Have you started to feel this yet? I mean, as we're praying, uh, even just now, I'm going, I got to start getting Amazon going. I don't want to bust those guys later on. I, I want to bless those, those UPS drivers because they're going to be super busy with all the procrastinators. I don't want to procrastinate. I got to get going on that right after this. I mean, as we're praying, that's what's going on in my mind. The busyness and the hurriedness is creeping in on us, even if we are not aware that it's creeping in on us. If you haven't gotten your Christmas lights up yet, it's December 2nd. You're late. Especially if you're in your pecan grove, you're like a month late. <laughs> it's, it's growing. The roar is growing. The speed is increasing. And yet God is calling us to slow down. See, that's the paradox. That's the trouble. That's the tension for us believers that we don't get caught up in the pace. But that we intentionally slow down. Down. I don't know if you've ever been like on the, the, the freeway, but when you intentionally slow down while everybody else is going faster, you need to move over. Otherwise, you're liable to get hit. That's the culture that we're in, right? Everybody's in the fast lane. We need to move over on the right-hand side and just tap the brakes a little bit, slow down. Everybody else is going 85, but the speed limit still says 70. And know, it feels like we're going at a snail's pace. We're actually still cruising at a really good speed. See, that's the tension that's on us right now. And as we do, we are looking at this first week of hope. Being a people that are rooted in hope. I believe that we as human beings are wired for hope. It is the thing that gets you through Monday, is it not? Because everybody's working for the weekend. It's the hope of the weekend. That's what gets you through Monday is the hope of something future. That's what gets you through rehab after surgery, not that I would know anything about that, is that there's a hope of, 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 of renewal. There's a hope of full healing that will one day come. Lord, help me. There's full recovery that will be there. What gets us through anything difficult, it is the thought of knowing that at some point, the pain will end. Yesterday, I was um, in my back patio, and I was trying my hardest to like tear that thing down. And um, on Friday, a friend came over and he just put his whole body weight into it and showed me that you actually have to be a man to tear things down. Um, and so uh, yesterday, all day long, I'm suffering through this. and I'm going, why won't anybody just hear my text, my call for help, to just come over and help? No, I'm out there all by myself, just knocking that thing down, one literal two by four at a time. The whole thing won't come down. 
But my, I'm just standing there going, this is a good picture of Advent, actually. One day, this little temporary pain that I'm in will one day end when this thing comes down or I just manipulate you all to come over to my house after today and uh, we'll all be fine. This hope, though, this hope for something in the future is hardwired into our hearts. Ecclesiastes would say this, that God has put eternity into our hearts. God has put eternity into our hearts. And for millennia, we have tried to fill that which is eternal with something that is temporary. You see, it's a, it's a game that we can't win because eternity is set into our hearts and we try to fix it with temporal pleasures, comfort, security. And all that does is leave us exhausted and still wanting more. We were talking earlier, I attribute this somewhat um, to this, like your appetite for sugar, if you don't know this, your appetite for sugar is just going to grow as you get more sugar. And so if you, if you feed the sugar rush that you want, that my body wants with cookies, not that anybody would do this at night, but with cookies, then all you're going to want is more cookies. I haven't figured this out. I'm going to figure it out at some point. But that's what happens with our appetites. We long for something that will not satisfy. And the more we get it, the more we crave it. And the more we crave it, the more we find ourselves in a devastating reality that that which we are trying to find to fill it up will not satisfy because God has put eternity in our hearts. See, that's what it looks like for us to be a people that are longing in hope. And so I ask you, are you longing for something more these days? Are you hoping for something that is yet future during Advent? Or are you looking around and going, yeah, I'm going to have that. I'm going to get that. Uh-huh, we're going to do that. Yep, yep, sleigh ride. Yep, we're going to do that. We're going to do hay ride. Yep, no problem. We've got to do that. That's tradition. We've got to do that. Yep, we're going to do white elephant. Yep, we're going to do that. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, it just roars around us. And I just wonder if we are longing for something more. Have you made or attempted to make your home here? Because chances are, if you're like me, you have. Chances are, if you're like me, you've forgotten how to hope for something that is promised and yet future. And in our waiting, in our waiting, we have stopped looking up. We've started to look left. We've started to look right. We've started to compare how big are my lights? How bright are my lights? They're not LED. They're traditional. My neighbor's lights are LED. This looks really terrible next to theirs. All of a sudden, we've got comparison. And the things that we're trying to do all of a sudden empty us of joy. You see, comparison is the great thief to joy. Unless we're comparing the right things. You see, Advent reminds us that some comparison is okay. Okay. Some comparison is okay. Not the comparison that goes left or right, but the comparison that compares our life with the future. That's where this scripture starts. Romans 8, 18. I want to read it again. This is what the Bible says, y'all. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth to comparing with the glory that is yet to be revealed to us. See, this current life is not even worth comparing to that which is coming. The current sufferings that you and I may have, and we do have them. See, there's a great temptation, two great temptations for us when it comes to suffering. We, one, we just pretend like we're not suffering. It's not that bad. We're good. We're okay. We'll just power through. We'll get to the end. Everything's going to be okay. And the other is everything is suffering. Everything is a sufferable moment. And, and, and I would just say this, like, for us to be a people of hope, we've got to lean into the reality that this, this life, there are some temporary sufferings. Whether it be physical ailments or giving in a temptation of sin or circumstantial sufferings, it's no wonder that the end of Christmas, half of you will find yourself with at least $1,000 worth of credit card debt. After spending your cash, you're still going to rack up some debt. It's also no wonder that about 5% of us are going to have $5,000 worth of debt that you didn't have starting in December. Retail therapy gains. The commercials suck us in, and consumerism takes a hold of our heart. See, we give in to the narrative that we deserve something, and so we attempt to purchase it to bring us happiness, even if it's temporary. We know it's temporary, but we still do it. 
And I would say this, this is the most cruel message of our day, the promise of eternal relief with temporary solutions. Uh, Paul David Tripp put out an Advent uh, devotional, and um, one of the things he writes, and actually I think he put this out online this week, he says this about the Christmas story which is unfolding around us. Uh, This is Paul David Tripp's words. He says, the Christmas story which the surrounding culture celebrates puts us at the center the place for God and God alone. It looks to creation for fulfillment rather than worship of the creator. It makes physical pleasure our primary need than the rescuing intervention of the redeemer. It's dominated by the comforts of the moment rather than eternal priorities. It encourages us to find comfort where comfort cannot be found and to place our hope in things that will never deliver. You guys feeling this? Feeling this in our culture? See, verse 18 is going to encourage us that our suffering, whether it be from our sin, the sin of others, or whether we get caught up in circumstantial suffering is not the end. As I was writing about suffering, I got a phone call uh, from someone whom I dearly love, and he's like, hey, dude, um, I hate to tell you this, but we're moving. And that to me is a suffering uh, to endure as a pastor, that they're, they're moving. I'm like, man, like for the love. We love y'all. Y'all just got here, but we're moving. And while I'm on the phone with him, I got an email from one of my best friends in the Act 29, Act 29 network. He's an older guy who has spoken life into me and my wife, which very few older uh, couples have done that for us. And he's one of them. And he emails me and he just sends me a video of his announcement to his church that he's leaving his church in Houston and headed to California. And my heart just ached because these are friends, they're good friends, we love them and yet they will leave a hole in our lives. It is a suffering of circumstance that I cannot control and although that may be not what you're going through, that is what we kind of go through on a, on a regular. And so whatever suffering that you're going through, the promise is this, this is not the end. There's something greater. And this right now is not worth, the Bible says, comparing to the glory that is to be revealed. When will that be? It will be at the second advent of Jesus. When Jesus comes and he does not wear a crown of thorns, but the crown of the king of kings. So the question that I'll ask again, what are you hoping for? And is it something that Jesus said he would fulfill? Because if not, you are in for a long, arduous journey of disappointment after disappointment. He did not tell us that he was going to take away our trouble. Instead, he told us that he would be with us in the midst of our trouble. And that's the promise of Advent. That's the hope of Advent. That God with us, Emmanuel. But I fear that we have not longed for Jesus to come. But we have done everything we can in our power and whatever's in our wallet to secure a comfort for ourselves. See, Advent reminds us that this is not our home. Verse 19 through 23, look at this. For the creation, all of creation, waits with eager longing for the revelation or the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to the, chil- uh, to the corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Man, that is a groaning that is too deep for us to even express. All of creation is groaning for the revealing of God himself to come back. The second advent of Jesus. And do we join all of creation longing for him to come back? Do we join all of creation or do we just kind of go, no, 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 no. I'm not listening. Earmuffs, not listening. Moving on. We're going to just celebrate. We're going to keep going. Or do we just lean into groaning and longing for hope? All of creation groans due to its subjection to futility. I love this idea. I hate this idea, but I love this idea. This word for futility is frustration. Like, I don't know if you deal with this in your work, but you, you set out every Monday and you're like, it's going to be an efficient week. 
we're going to rock it this week. We're going to kill it this week. And by Friday, you're just lamenting over all the things that didn't get done. Because all of creation has been subjected to futility, frustration. Yes, it bears some fruit, but never the amount of fruit that it was designed to bear. Why? Because of Adam and Eve. When they sinned in Genesis 3, the world of Genesis 1 and 2 was subjected to frustration. And we feel this, don't we? With every earthquake in Alaska, with every orphan down in Richmond, we are reminded that all creation groans for the coming of Jesus. With every war and every intimidation tactic, this truth that we are not yet where we were designed to be wounds us. With every trip to the pharmacy to refill and after refill, there is a hope beyond temporary relief. With every crime against an objectified humanity, we are reminded that this place is not as it once was and not yet what it will one day be. Or have we settled? Have we settled to try and make this place as comfortable as possible? Or do we join creation in groaning, in longing for that which only God will give us You see, it's not just all of creation, but we who are filled with the Spirit. Verse 23 says this, and not only all of creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Friends, don't buy into the lie that just because you follow Jesus doesn't mean you're going to not suffer Instead, the New Testament would tell us, don't be surprised when a fiery trial comes upon you. Don't be surprised by it. That's what the New Testament would say over and over again, that you're going to suffer many kinds of trials, various, all kinds. Whatever suffering you have endured, God has a purpose for it. And one of those purposes is that this place is not our home. Now, you guys may know... um, Last Easter, my oldest daughter got baptized. It was one year ago tonight. It was on this Sunday, uh, one year ago. Really, it's December 3rd, so we'll celebrate it tomorrow night. When I remember being up in her room, 10-something p.m., and she's weeping and crying because the darkness had left in her heart and in her mind, and the light of the gospel all of a sudden burst forth in new birth in her heart. I will never forget that moment. I pray I never forget that moment. Because in that moment, she also asked me with great wisdom of a nine-year-old, what happens when the darkness comes back? What do I do, Dad? I just read to her from John 16 where he says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. See, let us lean into groaning inwardly that the darkness may come back on my little girl and in our hearts, and it has come back many times, but we groan inwardly for something more. Let's do this in hoping for God what he will do in the future, not what we can purchase in the present, because this world is not meant to satisfy us. God will do whatever necessary to wean you off of the satisfactions of this world. I remember not too long ago, several years ago actually, I had lunch with a man who had a great job. This is what he was describing to me over lunch. I have a great job. My wife and my children love me and they respect me. And in his words, I'm making more money than I've ever made before in my life. He looks at me over lunch and he goes, so tell me, is this all there is? See, everything that the world had said would satisfy him. And he looks at me and he goes, is this all there is? What do you think my answer was? Yep, this is all the world has to offer you, man. If you're looking for hope in those things, this is all it has to give you. But God has called you to something different, to not just accumulate and accumulate and accumulate, because at some point, accumulation has to give birth to generosity. Accumulation has to just cease because you will not find ultimate satisfaction in getting more stuff, more friends, more time on your calendar so that you can just be more free in retirement. That will not do it. Instead, there's something greater for you, friend. And he looked at me and he was like, okay, that's not what I was expecting for you to just say, yeah, that's it, man. Like, this is it. Now, here's the sad part in me. 
Shortly after this conversation with him, after I thought, man, like I thought like that was a pretty good sales pitch to just being content with what God's given you and then just bless others, he uprooted his family for a job with even more money, even though he'd been making more money than he'd ever made. And he went to an even better neighborhood, even though he'd lived in an affluent neighborhood in our community. So he uprooted his family to go make more money in a more desirable neighborhood because that's the answer in this world. More, more, more. How much money do you need to get through Christmas? A little bit more. How much time do you need to get a little rest? A little bit more. You ask anyone who's, who's affluent or wealthy, which by the way, that's you in the world and me. How much money do you need? A little bit more. How much, how much money in your budget do you need? A little bit more. There's never a dollar amount, it's just a little bit more. That's what's weighing in on us, and unfortunately, we miss the point, right? I celebrate that guy. I'm not, I'm not here to dog on him. Instead, I groan with him. But this world is a tempting place to find satisfaction for that which is eternal. C.S. Lewis, Lewis put it like this. He said, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. See, Advent reminds us that this is not our home. And since this world is not our home, we long for something more. And we long in hope. Let me read this last bit of this passage. Verse 23 would say this, excuse me, for, uh, 24. For in this, right? Right? Actually, I'm going to go back to 23. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of, of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. Not hope that is seen, uh, now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, this future glory, this kingdom that's coming, we wait for it with patience. So the question that I have yet to answer is, what is hope? What is hope? Is it not a certainty that God's going to fulfill something in the future? The realization that something is currently missing, but the deep confidence that holds fast through suffering, through want, through deeper desires, that God will provide that which is missing. It is the looking forward to something in the future, not with, a, not with vanity, no, not with vanity, but with a confidence, certainty of the outcome. It's not a vanity like, I hope you start to feel better next week. No, it is a hope in Jesus' character that he is coming to make all things new, to bring our deepest satisfaction to fruition. How can we be so certain of that future hope? That's what the Bible says. Like, you're not hoping for something that's already happened. It's hum we're hoping for something that is yet in the future, something we don't see. We believe it. We hope for it. There's a confidence there. How can we be so confident? The past is the greatest indicator of what will happen in the future. So we have to look back in order to look forward. And what a great time to look back than Advent as we look at some prophecy about Jesus. Let me run down three from Isaiah. Isaiah 9, 6, this is what the Bible says. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's about the birth of Jesus. Verse, uh, chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, that is from, from the line of David. He will be a king from David's line. And the branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And look at the promise. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And what we see at Jesus' baptism is the spirit of the Lord resting upon someone for the first time in history. And all of a sudden he gives us that same spirit that rests in us, that dwells in us. What great confidence we have. Isaiah 53, not just the cradle, not just the crown, but what happened in the middle, the cross. 700 years before Jesus was here, this was prophesied about him. He was despised. He was rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. 
Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, and upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. So we look back to see what God is going to be up to in the future. And we also look back so that we can know that he has done all these things. Surely he will make good on the promises for the future. So what is it that we're looking forward to? Yes, it is the coming of Jesus, but there's more to it than that. Verse 20 and 21 says that the hope is that we're hoping for the coming of Jesus, that he would set us free from slavery to corruption. That's the world we're in, y'all. Slavery to decay. We don't probably have to be reminded of that the older that we get. But also this, this is the hope, y'all. We spent now this time looking at what we're in, looking at these false promises. I want you to see what we're looking for as believers in Jesus. The revelation, but verse 19 and 23 says that we are longing, we are groaning. All of creation is groaning for what? Verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing for the, revel- for the revealing of the sons of God. Verse 23, and not only the creation, we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. See, the future hope that God is always pointing us to is resurrection, is full redemption. So even during Advent, are we then looking to Easter? Are they looking for the promise of resurrection? So that's what creation is looking for because it's subjected to futility. We too are subjected to futility. So we have a groaning and a longing for something more that God will make all things new for an environment for humanity that is going to be absolutely glorified and perfect in every way. See, that's what's gonna happen in the future our hope is not that we would just not make this, um, uh, this place, this temporary place more comfortable. It would also be not that we would escape this place. No, our hope is in the future redemption of our bodies, the revealing of the sons of God. All creation is looking and longing and waiting for Jesus to come back because when he does, those sinful humans that ruined this place, they'll be made new too. They'll be redeemed too. And creation is longing for us to be good stewards of this place. And that will only happen when Jesus comes back and renews this place. This, it says in verse 24, this is in this hope we are saved. Super specific hope of resurrection, of redemption, of renewal that Jesus has promised to do in the future. Advent reminds us that Jesus came as a baby, died like a criminal, raised like a king from the dead, ascended unto heaven as God, and will return again to make good on his promise that the resurrection of the dead and the renewal of all things. So this is the hope, y'all. Revelation 21. As I read this, just think about this future glory that is to come. Revelation 21, one through five says this, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. That's the promise of Advent. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. And though it came temporarily, it will be eternal. Behold, look, see, this is on display. The character of God will now be revealed that he longs to be with us. Let us not grow entitled with the presence of God as Christians. Let us not be satisfied even with the Spirit's presence in us, within us because this world is groaning and longing for the full presence of God to be revealed. Do we join it? And we go on because with that. Instead of satisfying ourselves now, we long in hope for something future. Verse 4 would say this, for it's there he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, 
nor pain anymore for the former things. Those things, they will have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And also he said, Write it down, trustworthy and true. It's going to happen. I'm saying it, it's gonna happen. That's the character of our God. Write it down. Don't forget this. You see, verse 21 would say this in, back in Romans 8, that, that, we, um, that all of creation, um, that we are subjected uh, to futility. Verse 21 would say this. I think it's 21. Yeah, 22. The whole creation has been groaning together like the pains of childbirth until now. Like as a dude, I don't know what the pains of childbirth are. But I have watched my wife go through them three times. And I know that I don't want that. That's just like an understatement. I don't want that. I, there's never been more time where I'm like, I'm really grateful, Lord, that you made me a man. <laughs> because I'm not like that. It just hurt. It looks like it hurts a lot. Like for a long time. <laughs> but here's like, <laughs> oh, help me. My wife's in here. Yeah. All right, good. Uh, so like that's just the reality. But this is what the Bible says about all of creation. That all of creation is in that much pain. And what makes that pain bearable is there's going to be new birth at the end of it. See, that's what makes the pain of, of childbirth bearable is that there will be new fruit that is to come. And the Bible says that we are all in that kind of pain, longing for something to come, longing for something to be birthed upon the earth. When Jesus comes, the redemption of our bodies, the revealing of the sons of God, that's you and me, the full number of believers in Christ coming down from heaven, fully resurrected, fully redeemed, fully glorified in a new heaven and a new earth. This was yet the beginning of our hope. The future of it. We still now look. We still now wait. We still now long for Jesus to make this this greater reality when he comes back. So, may we all join in this creation. May we all join in the longing, in the hope of something better than this place with the acknowledgement that there will be suffering only to remind us that this world is not our home and he is yet to come. And when he does, all things new. Let's look for that during this Advent season. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, help us. Help us understand what this looks like. We've painted a picture now of groaning and longing and hoping for something future. Would you also help us grasp on to this last bit of verse 25 that... What we hope for, we do not see, and we wait for it with patience. Lord, help us be patient. We are, we are terrible at being patient. So would you help us be patient as we wait and we long for that which you promised, that you are coming, you are coming soon. And the cry of our hearts, Lord, is that you would make all things new. Would you make us new now as we long for the culmination of that one day. As we grow impatient, as we hope in the dark and yet wait for the light, help us to look up. Help us to realize that this world will have suffering, but it's not worth comparing to that which is going to be revealed. This measure of glory that you're storing up for us. That's what makes this uh, able to be endured. Not getting more stuff compared to left or right. So may we be captured by this vision that you're coming back, you're going to make it new, you're going to make it right, you're going to take away all the bad things and make good on all the good things that we need to be satisfied in you. This eternity that you've put in our hearts, I pray, Lord, that we would long and wait and hope for eternity to come to earth. Help us. We need you. We love you. May we respond now with hope. Amen.
quotes the Bible says this. It says, If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep or died. For as by man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. That's the hope, not just for this life, but for the one to come, resurrection. Let me pray for us and give us some reminders as we go today. Father, would you remind us that this place is not our home? Would you help us uh, be a living hope? A living monument of what is to come that the world around us, though they speed it up, they wonder why is it that they're so satisfied in the right-hand lane going slower? And if we're not satisfied going slower, would you help us? I'm not. I like to go fast. I like to get there. Advent calls us to just wait. Long for something more. It's coming. He's making us ready. There's a bride. It's coming. Waiting for the coming of our king. So would you make us ready in the meantime and would you help us long in hope? We love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.